All right. So before the break, what we saw was that actually the transfer, the, the first order term in the denominator of a transfer function in general can be written as the sum of all the zero value time constant of the system. And then we also saw that the first term in the numerator is given by this. We will get back to this later, not, not here right now. But the key result from before the, lecture, before, the, uh, before the break was this result, which I'm going to reproduce here. So basically we said if you have an nth order system whose transfer function is shown as h of s in general with a denominator of the form b1s plus b2s squared all the way up to bn sn, then b1 was, is given by the sum of all the zero value time constants of the system, which basically means that you set all the other elements, all the other reactive elements to zero value, which means that capacitors get open circuited and inductors get short circuited. And of course, all the independent sources are nulled. And then you calculate what the resistance is seen by each one of them. You multiply by that the component value, let's say it's a capacitor, or if it's an inductor, you divide the inductor by that value and get these time constants. So this is what we knew before, right? So, and this is an exact relationship. Okay? Now, the question is, can we use this to estimate the bandwidth of a, an amplifier? How can we use that? How, is it possible to use this? Now, in general, an amplifier will, let's say it could be a bandpass amplifier, right? So if you have a bandpass amplifier, something like that, you have a mid-range gain, and then you have a low-pass res low response and a high-pass response. So these two frequencies, we call this omega L and omega H. Now, we also saw before that you, if you have something like this, you can, you can break up, you can factor the transfer function in terms of a bunch of terms that were in the form of Z1 over S, 1 over Z2 over S, all the ones. We call them inverse poles and inverse zeros in the earlier lectures. P1 over S minus P2 over S, et cetera, et cetera. A mid-range, which is basically the gain here. And then times the terms that define the low-pass response, this part, which is S over ZK plus 1 all the way up to 1 minus s over zm, and then 1 minus s over pk plus 1, all the way to 1 minus s over pn. Right? And what we saw is that these are the, we call, what we call inverse poles and inverse zeros. These guys correspond to this part of the response. And these correspond to the, high pa the low pass part of the response in general. Now, we are going to be focusing for now on the, the using these time constants, determining this omega h, using zero value time constants. And we'll come back later, a few lectures later, to determining this omega l using what we call the infinite value time constants. We'll come to that. So when we are talking about, for now, a bandwidth, we are es essentially assuming that this part doesn't exist. And if pa that part doesn't exist, then the system is reduced to a low-pass response of this form. And this would be A0, essentially, right? So we are only dealing with this part of it now. So that's the implicit assumption we are making. Or basically, another way of saying this is that we are assuming that's a low-pass system. It's a DC system that has the same gain at DC that it has at low frequencies, and at some point it starts losing gain. And a lot of systems are like that. But, so that's the assumption we are starting with. And if that's the case, we want to see if we can estimate the transfer function. Now, we are making an, let's make an approximate assumption. Let's assume that there is no dominant zero in the transfer function. So we are making, so there's an assumption here. of no zeros, or no dominant zeros. No, let's say, or important zeros in the transfer function. In that case, 
your transfer function is written like this, right? So, and you have something of this form. The question we have is, can we use what we know so far to estimate what this omega h is? Omega h is the frequency at which this basically the gain drops by 3 dB, meaning that the power is reduced by a factor of 2, or the voltage gain is reduced by a factor of square root of 2. Okay, because voltage, of course, power is proportional to voltage squared. Now, so this is essentially omega negative 3 dB. So this is 3 dB drop. We are trying to estimate this omega h. Can we estimate it with what we know? What if we argue, I would argue that if I look at this term, so let's start from very low frequencies. When I'm at very, very low frequencies, would any of these terms matter? No, right? I start from low frequencies, my gain is A0, right? A0, 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 A0. When they start becoming important, which term do you think matters the, the most? Which one kicks in first? B1, right? And as you go to higher frequencies, these guys become more important, right? So it's not completely unreasonable to assume then that omega h is so the transfer function around the omega h can be approximated as A0 being just the first order transfer function. And if you make this approximation, then obviously omega h for a first order system is exactly 1 over B1. Right? And of course, since this is, this is an approximation, then the omega h for the overall system would be an approximation of 1 over b1, which is basically now exactly equal to the sum of all the zero value time constants. Now, if you know this, the interesting question is, OK, so first of all, is this true? Well, it's an approximation. It's not exact, unless the system is first order. But how good of an approximation is it, and what kind of approximation is it? Well, let's find out if it's a, so the question is that, is it a conservative or a liberal approximation? Or it could be either in general. So let's find out. Let's look at the second order term. Let's say to find out the answer to that question, to find the answer to that question, let's look at the second order term. So let's assume that your transfer function is A0, 1 plus B1S plus B2S squared. Right? We are trying to find really H of omega. So H of J omega is A0, and then this guy gives me 1 minus B2 omega squared, right? Plus J B1, B1, or, or J omega B1. Agreed? So now look at this. With or without the B2 term, around this point, so this is the, this is the more accurate transfer function. A around the omega H, if I didn't have this term, would this transfer function be smaller or bigger? S smaller, right? Without the B term. When you have this, because it reduces the size of the denominator exactly, as you said, it makes the transfer function larger. So the actual transfer function, if I didn't have this, basically if I were thinking about only the first order system, I would be lower. So this is the first order system at omega h. So this is the first order. So the bandwidth that I s, so if that's the first order, then it means that this is what I get from 1 over B1. So my bandwidth estimate, is it conservative or liberal? Conservative. I underestimate my bandwidth with this, which is actually probably a good thing. Because it means that if I design using this, I should at least get the, what I expect to get. I have a little bit of a margin. Now, it could be use, I mean, this doesn't, the fact that it's conservative by itself doesn't make it necessarily useful because something can be too conservative. I mean, I can give you an example. I mean, if I estimate the bandwidth, I, I have a very accurate, a very good conservative estimate of bandwidth that's always accurate. Zero. <laughs> right? But it's not useful. The question is, how useful is that? 
So we will see through examples where it fails, but and we can just we will discuss in a second what, how, where it fa fails and how it can fail and how we can actually improve that estimate if we need to. But in general, this is a useful thing. This is quite useful that at actually you can estimate the bandwidth by using the time constant because what it says is that you can look at your zero value time constant and identify the large ones and focus your design effort on those to improve a given design. So let's talk about the ways in a real system that this can fail. When you want to find something that fails, you have to think about the assumptions that you've made. One assumption is obviously here, that there are no zeros. If there are zeros, they can actually push the transfer function up, right? And we are ignoring, we are completely oblivious if we are doing this to zeros, because we are not even looking at any of the transfer constants, which determines the h's, right? So we'll modify this method later to include the effect of zeros. So we'll just have an improvement or add on to it, which is a mon minor modification to the time constants. So we'll do that later. So that's fine. How else can it fail in terms of being significantly off, being way off in terms of underestimating the bandwidth a lot? How else can it do that? What else can happen? What else are we oblivious to when we are looking at the sum of the time constants? On the second order term? Yes, but the second, we argued that we are, since we are interested in this transition point, it could be, yes, you're right. I mean, that, that's one way they can come in. You can have higher order terms that matter. But more specifically, there's something that we don't see when we look at the sum of the time constants about the poles. We talked about this a little bit before, right? It's a complex, yes, complex poles, yes, right? There's a imagine conjugate pole. Basically, the, the re imaginary part of the pole frequency, right? It's completely lost. It's not seen. So if you have poles that have a si significant imaginary part as complex conjugate pairs, they, and they will appear as complex conjugate pairs, then those can mess up the, the response, right? Your response could, be look, could have a transfer function that looks like this. And those are generated by complex poles, and you won't see any of that in the time, some of, this sum of the time constant. You will see them in the B2 and B3 and all those things, but not in B1. Or if you have zeros, there are quite a few assumptions here that we need to be aware of. So if this starts failing, you have to look at those assumptions and see which ones they've been violated. But generally still, it's quite a, pre, quite a powerful tool. And we'll see that. We'll see that as, a, as an example. So let's, let's do a design example to demonstrate how this is applied and how it's used. And let's set a design example. So let's move to this other whiteboard. and set up our design example. So, so the, our design objectives, I have written some stuff here. So let's say you want to make an amplifier. So it's a box with an input, um, an input resistance of, um, what did I call it, R1, of one kilo ohm, source resistance of one kilo ohm, a voltage source, V in, and a capacitive load of 150 femtofarads. So that's C out. Let's call this C out. So we have we want to make an amplifier that has a that's driven by a source with source resistance of one kilo ohm. It drives a load resist load capacitance of 150 uh, femtofarads, and we want an AV, a voltage gain greater than 50. And we want to maximize its bandwidth. To make it more interesting, let's make it, a, make it out of BJTs. So let's say you have a beta of 100. Uh, I have some parameters here. So let me just, uh, you have the transistor parameter, CJE, the junction capacitance for the emitter is going to be 20 femtofarads. The junction capacitance for the collector is another 20 femtofarads. The collector to substrate, the, the substrate junction capacitance is like, let's say, 50 femtofarads. Tau F is 2 picoseconds. 
Um, okay. And okay, so these are the parameters you need from the transistor about the transistor. Um, and then these translate to some parameters for the action, so we can calculate some parameters. So let's say, just to make our lives easier for now, let's say that we are biasing all of our transistors at one milliamp for now. So we can make it have a bunch of numbers to work with, and we can also modify that later on. So let's say your IC, so these are, these are design choices now. So I put them in a different color that I've made. IC is one milliamp. So that translates to certain values for capacitance. So I have to calculate the capacitance for the BJT, right? So if this is a BJT, right? So where are these capacitors sitting? There's a CJC, right? Which is the C mu, right? It's called C mu. There is the C pi that consists of two parts, if you remember. There's the CJE, the junction capacitance, plus, plus the charge storage capacitance, CB. And CB was GM tau F. Now, what's the GM for bipolar transit at 1 milliamp? It's IC over VT, let's say 40 millisiemens, right, for 1 milliamp. Times that, that gives you a CB, which is GM tau f of 80 femtofarads for that value. And these translates to capacitor values, right? So, and okay, and then they have the CJS, by the way, which is hanging off of here, CJS to ground, the collector to ground junction. So which we have given here, 50 femtofarads. So these values then become C pi, is basically the sum of CJE and the CB, which is 20 femtofarads plus 80 femtofarads, so 100 femtofarads. C mu, which is just the CJC, which is 20 femtofarads, one fifth. So this capacitor is one fifth of that capacitor. And then you have a CS, let's call it C, I think I called it CS. Or Yeah, okay, fine, CS, um, which is, again, CJS, which is, we, we said is 50 femtofarads. From these values, by the way, we can calculate the FT of the transistor, right? What is the FT of the transistor? We know from our previous calculations that FT or omega T, well, that's right, omega T, omega T is going to be GM over C pi plus C mu. So it is uh, 40 millisiemens divided by 120 femtofarads. So that's like a 3 milli and femto give you a pico here. So it says one third times 10 to the 12 divided by 6 for, to get the frequency. This is angular frequency. So that's basically, let's say, 310 to the 11 divided by um, 2 pi. So divided by pi, you get 10 to the 11. So you get 510 to the 10, right? Which is 50 gigahertz, roughly. So the FT of the transistor operating at this current is around 50 gigahertz. FT meaning the current gain becomes 1. And this is not the fastest transistor out there. There are transistors with FTs of, like BJTs nowadays, with FTs of several hundred gigahertz, which you can use. But I mean, this is a decent, this is a good transistor. This is a decent transistor. So, OK, fine. Um, you can use that. OK, so we have, so that tells you that, like, what the cutoff frequency of the transistor is around 50 gigahertz. The unity current gain frequency of this transistor is around 50 gigahertz. Okay, but now let's start our design. So the question is, so we have these parameters, and we want to make something that has a gain of such and such. Right? So we have to pick values for these things. So what is the gain? What is the DC gain of the stage is determined by the kind of transistor and the stage that we choose. So we have to choose a topology. Right? This is the design. This is open-ended, really. So how do we choose the topology? 
the basic the principle rule number one or law number one of engineering, right? In the absence of other kind of extenuating circumstances, the simplest solution is the best solution. So what is the simplest stage that gives us, of the stages that we know, that gives us gain? Our objective, by the way, here is to maximize the bandwidth. So we want to kind of, so let me just be very clear about it. Maximize bandwidth. We are trying to make a low-pass low amplifier, which basically has gain down to DC, and we want to maximize the gain. So what is the first stage that comes to your mind? What's the simplest single transistor stage that gives you gain? More than 50. Common emitter, right? Common emitter is a very basic stage or common source. If you were doing MOSFETs, it's the same thing. So let's start with that. Let's start with our design being the common emitter. So let's make this the common emitter amplifier. And I have a load resistor I will call R2. So this is the, this is the amplifier. Then there's the source resistance. Let's say R1, which is 1 kilo ohm, and V in. And then there's, of course, the capacitive load. They call C out, or C, let's call CL. CL, because it's a single index then, single letter index. It's called CL, so I have a CL here. So we have to make this stage to have a gain of more than 50, first of all. So what is the gain of the stage? Well, if you want to, if you're in doubt, of course you can always do this. You can, you know that you have an R pi looking into here, right? So what's the gain? The gain is the voltage gain from here to there times the voltage gain from here to there, right? What is the voltage gain from here to there? It's the voltage resist, it's a resistive divider, right? If you, if you draw this, in this case, the pi model is the better model to draw, right? So you have R pi and R1. You have a word resistive divider here. So your gain will be, it will have a resistive divider between R pi and R1, right? Which is the voltage gain from here to there. Then times the voltage gain from here to there. What's the voltage gain from here to there? If this voltage is V1, right? This current is GMV1. It's being pulled out of the parallel combination of R2 and RO. Now, RO of this transistor, I didn't give you even a VA. Let's say if it's 100 volts, that would be 100 kilo ohms. And we want to gain, that is, let's, let's calculate the numbers. Let's calculate, let's pick this number to gain be something. So first of all, what is this value? What is this attenuation at the input, rough num numerically? So what is R pi? R, R pi is beta Rm, right? For 40 millisiemens, it's Rm. So Rm is 25 ohms, which makes R pi what? Beta times that, 2.5 kilo ohms. So you have a voltage divider between 2.5 kilo ohms and 1 kilo ohm. So 2.5 divided by 3.5, whatever that is, right? What is that? 2.5, oops. 2.5 divided by 3.5 is 0.71. Okay, so this is 0.71, roughly. And then I have the, and then that gets multiplied by the gain of the, intrinsic gain of the, the, the gain of the stage from here to there, right? So let's say we are not limited by the RO. What is that gain? We need to verify that. It's GM R2 with a minus sign, right? It's an inverting gain. So what is GM R2? Well, we don't know what R2 is. We have to design it. How should I pick this gain to have some margin and have a gain of greater than 50? So I have this factor of 0.71, right? So what if we gain, make the gain 80, right? Because 80 times times 70 gives me like 56, so I have some margin over 50, right? And I would be a little bit over, so I have some, a little bit of margin. So if I want to make the gain 80, what should the R2 be? 
GM R2, 40 millisiemens times R2 is going to be 80. So it's going to be 2K, right? So we'll set R2 to 2K. This is a choice at this point. And that would make my gain what? It would make this basically times 80. So my overall gain is going to be roughly around negative 56, 57, something like that. Okay? So that's, my, that's our gain. Now, that is essentially what the gain looks like. So that's fine. Now, let's find out what the bandwidth is. OK? What is the bandwidth? How do we calculate the bandwidth? Well, we have to put the capacitors there, right? What are the capacitors? We have a C pi here. We have a C mu here. And then we have a C S here. OK? So first of all, let me ask you this question. How many poles and how many zeros does this system have? You should be able to tell from this. And you should be able from the tests that we've devised. And also, you should be able to tell me what kind of zeros and what kind of poles you have, especially what kind of zeros you have, left half plane, right half plane, things like that. So how many poles do we have, first of all? How many degrees of freedom does, system, does this system have? Two, right? The way to find out is look at how many independent initial conditions can you set. If I set this voltage to be one volt and with this voltage to be two volts, I, this voltage is set to be the initial condition for these capacitors, which are in parallel actually now. I mean, if I pay attention, I can see that they are in this, the, I can lump them into one capacitor. I can combine these two and say, call it C out. Or actually, no, I sh well, I should have called this C out, so this becomes CL. Sorry. So let's make this C out again. I was it was right to begin with, I messed it up. <laughs> messed it up. Um, OK. So, OK, so now you have these three capacitors, CL, CMU, and CPI. But you can only set two initial conditions. How can you tell, tell if that condition, if something like that is happening? A telltale sign of that is a capacitive loop. If you have a closed capacitive loop you can only, of n capacitors, you can only set n minus 1 initial conditions. Because if you set those n minus 1 initial conditions, the nth initial condition is set. So you have one fewer degree of freedom. So you have two degrees of freedom. So it's a, there are two poles in this system. And this is an example of the case where there will be three time constants and two poles. So even the number of poles and zeros are not the same. Uh, the, the number of poles and the time constants are not the same. Sorry. They don't have the same number. So there are three time constants and two poles. So that's one. How many zeros? Or do we have zeros, first of all? Is there a capacitor shorting of which, or a combination of capacitor shorting of which would produce a non-zero output? Yes, there's one. C mu. So there's one zero. Now, you can even tell if it's a left half plane zero or right half plane zero. Does shortening of that capacitor change the polarity of the gain of the system? Yes. It does, right? So it's a right half plane zero. So we know the system has two poles and one right half plane zero. We already know a lot about it without even having written any equations. But now let's write the time constants. So let's calculate the time constants. So we'll start calculating these time constants and writing them down. So, so right now we have three time constants. Let's call this uh, tau pi zero, which is for the C. So it's C pi times something, right? So look at, let's look at this capacitor. I'm going to go back and forth between these two regularly. So what is the time constant, zero value time constant seen by C pi? It's the resistance seen by this guy when all the other capacitors are what? Zero value. Meaning, since they're all capacitors, become open circuits. So this is not, none of these capacitors are here. This guy, what's, what does this guy see, resistance wise? The source is null, too. To the left, what, is, what does it see? Looking to the left, it sees R1. And looking to the right, it says R pi. Right? So it's parallel combination of those two. Agreed? Do we agree? So the first time constant is going to be this times R1 parallel R pi. So make it numerical. So what C pi, what was C pi? C pi we said was 100 femtofarads 
100 femtofarads times 1 kilo ohm in parallel with 2.5 kilo ohms. I think that's like 700 ohms. It's, yeah, it's 700, it's 710. So it's 100 femtofarads times 710 ohms. What do you get? So you get seven point, you get uh, 71 picoseconds, roughly, I think. Yeah, roughly 70 picoseconds. 71 is over kilo. Yeah, seven. Okay? So you get 70 picoseconds there. Now, what else? So let's see. So that's one time constant, the C pi. Now, there is the C mu, right? Again, all the other capacitors are gone. You just need to find out what is the resistance looking across here, right? This resistance. What is that resistance? We've developed these, we developed these like calculations. We did all of these calculations for what it is, right? It's the R left plus R right plus GM effective R left, R right, right? You remember that? So what is R left? So let's, let's do that. So let's write it that way. Tau mu zero is going to be C mu times R left plus R right plus GM R left. This is non-degenerate. So you can write it this way. So what is R left? C mu is R left is this resistor, right? R1 parallel R pi. If you look at it, see R left, the resistance you see to the left, to, from the left side to the ground is R1 parallel R pi. So it becomes R1 parallel R pi. Plus, what is R right? The resistance from the right hand side, if you ignore RO, which we have, and it's fair to ignore it, by the way, right? Because our resistance is 2 kilo ohm. RO, if the VA was 100 volts, it would be 100 kilo ohms. So that's fine. That's fair. So what is R right? It's just R2, right? And if, by the way, if, even if it was, you can absorb it into R2. If, it, if you wanted to take RO into account, you can absorb it into R2. So this is R2 plus GM R2 R1 parallel R pi, right? which you can actually rewrite in a slightly better form. You can write as C mu 1 plus GM R2 R1 parallel R pi plus R2. And I'll tell you why it's a better form, because this should remind you of something. That's a Miller, Miller multiplication factor, because that's the gain, right? That's a 1 plus A in the Miller multiplication. So this times that is that Miller capacitance multiplication, right? C mu, so this is 1 plus A times C mu. You remember we saw that in the common uh, emitter? Uh, but OK, so that's fine. So but let's put numbers on it, right? So let's, let's see what's the dominant term. Um, we can write it that way or this way. So basically, we said it was 20 femtofarads times this term. Let's write it in this form. This, for, this term, which we have already calculated, it's like 700 ohms, 700 ohms, plus this one, which we set to be 2 kilo ohms, right? R2, which is 2 kilo ohms, plus this one. Now, this is 80. This is our gain, right? Times 700. So what do I get? I get 56K, right? Yeah, I get 56 k, 556 kilo ohms. So you can see that this guy is going to be the big contributor. But let's, let's just add them up. It's 58, 59 kilo ohms times 20 femto. Let's say if it were 60 kilo ohms um, times 200, 20 femto, it would be uh, 1,200 picoseconds or 1.2 nanoseconds. Right? Roughly. So that's the total, that's the time cost, second time constant. 
tau mu zero. And what is the tau L for this combination? Now, CL is CS, which is 150, 150 femtosecond, uh, sorry, CS, which is 50 femtofarad, plus C out, which is 150 femtosecond. So it's a total of 200 femtosecond, femtofarad, sorry. So tau L is 200 femto. Oops, let's, let's write the value. So it's CL, it's CL times, um, and the resistance it sees. What is the resistance that CL sees? If you null all the sources and the capacitors, this dependent current source in, this, in the R pi model, if you want to remember it, R pi, there is a GMV pi. This is V pi that goes to R2 to ground. So this current source is going to disappear because its value is 0, so it's just R2. So it's CL R2, which is 200 femtofarads times 2 kilo ohms. That's 400 picoseconds. And you wonder why I left all this open, right? They're going to fill it up. <laughs> but OK, so we have three time constants. So what is our bandwidth estimate? Let's do our bandwidth estimate. What is our bandwidth estimate? Well, we know that omega h is approximately 1 over the sum of the time constants. Because that's exactly equal to b, that denominator, b1. Right? So what is the sum of the time constants? So we have 7 picoseconds, 70 picoseconds, 1,200 picoseconds, 400 picoseconds. So that's 1,600 picoseconds, 16. 170, you, so the total time constant is 1,670 picoseconds. That's omega. And if you calculate that, you will see uh, a time constant of, uh, a, to a total bandwidth estimate of, uh, let's see, what do, I, what do we see? N so this is 2 pi times 95 megahertz. So you get a little bit, you get, you're, according to this, you're a little bit short of 100 megahertz bandwidth for this amplifier. Now, you can actually simulate this using a circuit simulator, like such as SPICE. And when you do that, what you see here is the transfer function. And what that is, so you can see the, ampl the body plots, the amplitude and phase. And the bandwidth estimates that the bandwidth is simulate, you simulate this, the simulated bandwidth, so simulations tells you, sim gives you 97 megahertz 3 dB bandwidth. So that's pretty close, right? It's a pretty good estimate in this case. Now you also see, if you look at, look at those carefully, you will see that there's a point this in the slope of the body plot amplitude that around 7 gigahertz, right? What happens is that you will see that the slope goes from negative 20 dB per decade to negative 40 dB per decade. Yeah. And what you see is that then, so you, it, the slope goes down. You also look at the phase plot. You will see that the phase takes another dip, right? So that tells you that there's a second pole there, right there, right? So there's a second pole at 7 gigahertz, roughly, from the simulations. And then you will see that after a, a, around 300 gigahertz or so, the slope comes back up. The slope from negative 40 dB per decade goes back to 20 dB per decade in that body plot. And then what it does, it becomes flat. But you see that the phase is actually continuing to go down, which means that this is a right half plane zero. So the left half plane zero will have a phase that will come back up. So, you can, so this exactly is consistent with what you expected to see in the system. Now, that bandwidth is pretty low for a transistor with a cutoff frequency of 50 gigahertz. You're getting only 100 megahertz, albeit it's 3 dB bandwidth. So you have to really look at the gain bandwidth product. So it's a, it's a 100 megahertz times the, uh, let's say, a gain of 50-ish. So that's um, 5 gigahertz gain bandwidth. No, no, yes, 5 gigahertz band, gain bandwidth product. 
So you're still about a factor of 10 away from what you, you possibly, I mean, first order approximation you can get. OK, so what do we do? The beauty of this method is that it actually gives you a way to identify the problem. What is the problem? What is the biggest time constant? This guy, right? Why is it so large? Because of the Miller effect, exactly. Because this capacitor, although this was the smallest of all three capacitors, right? This was 20 p femtofarad. This was 100, this was 200. This the smallest capacitor is giving you the biggest trouble. Why? Because as the voltage on this side goes up by a certain amount, the voltage on the other side goes down by 80 times that. So the current through the capacitor is 81 times greater, which makes the capacitance look 81 times greater. So this capacitor is Miller multiplied. So what do we do? How do we get around this problem? Well, we know the solution to this, right, to some extent. We need to, the problem is that we have gain, inverting gain, across a place where we have a capacitor. There's a stage that doesn't suffer from this, that doesn't have a capacitance between its input and output connected. What is that stage? Common base. So we need to couple, but the common base, the problem with the common base is that its input resistance is low. It's Rm. So if I put a common base here, then the gain will get killed at the input divider. Because then I will have 25 ohms and 1 kilo ohm and get nothing. I get a gain of 1, one over 40, roughly, right? So this guy is good for the input, but this is not very good for making you give you new gain, which leads us to a stage that combines the good parts of this, the common emitter, and the good parts of a common base, which we all know, cast code. And this is the number one reason we use cast code, really, the bandwidth. We said it before, you remember, was talking about gain nodes, and the, the, real, the most important reason is really the bandwidth. And let's see what it does. So let's keep the resistor here, I mean, the same, but let's put the second transistor here. So this is our, well, let me just put it up farther up. So yeah, I introduce a common base with some V bias here. I would get an R2. And then I would drive the CL, which is basically, because this guy will have its own CS. So this is CL. That is C out plus CJS or CS, which is 200 femtofarads on the output total. 150 of it is extrinsic, and 50 of it is because of the CJS of this transistor to the ground. Right? So what else do I have? What other capacitors do I have? I still have a bunch of other. Now I've introduced a whole bunch of new capacitors, actually. Right? I haven't taken anything out. I've just introduced a bunch of new capacitors. So where are they? So you have this capacitor here. right? And then you have this capacitor. So let's look at these a little bit carefully and see if there's some simplifications we can make. And you also have the CJS of this guy, CS of that first transistor, right? That was hanging off of it. So I have to introduce this. And that CS I've absorbed into this guy for the second transistor. So how many poles, how many zeros do I have? So first, I have to look at it carefully and see if I can make simplifications. From an AC perspective, what is this node? It's ground, right? So is it fair to say that this capacitor and that capacitor are in parallel? Right? So I take this one off of here and add it to this guy. So I have these two capacitors. I call it CE. So I had a 50 femtosferet here. And I have, what did I have? So C pi, 100 femto. So this is 150 femtofarads total. Let's call it CE to ground. Right? That captures those two capacitors. And where is this capacitor connected, by the way? That's also parallel with another capacitor, CL. So I, let me put it with the CL. So I add it to the CL. So my CL is really this plus C mu 2, so it's going to be 220 femtofarads. 
right? So now we've cleaned it up a little bit. Okay, and now we can analyze it a little bit better. So what, we, what, what do we have here? How many poles, how many zeros do you expect to see? How many poles first? How many independent initial conditions can we define? Three, right? I can define two between these three and then I can define one more for this guy. So I have three independent initial conditions that I can have, three degrees of freedom, so I have three poles. How many zeros do I have? How many capacitors are there, shorting of which? What's the largest number of elements that I can simultaneously infinite value, in this case, short circuit, that would produce the uh, non-zero output? One, still. Still, it's only this guy. If I short circuit this or this or that, my output goes to zero. So I have, st and it and still is the same right half, I mean it is right half plane. That zero is still right half plane, because you can ch see that it changes the polarity of the gain. System. Ha has my gain changed? Yes, a little bit, there's a factor of alpha there. But let's not worry about alpha, right? Uh, this gain has been multiplied by alpha because the current here is alpha times that current. Okay, now let's calculate the bandwidth again. We need to recalculate our time constants, some of them, some of which may have changed. So let's see which time constant has changed. Has tau pi changed? The resistance seen by C pi is not. And C pi hasn't changed either, right? So tau pi is the same still. That's 70 picosecond. But that was not a problem anyway. Okay, so now what? Let, well, let's see. So how about tau mu? Has tau mu changed? Well, tau mu was R, the R associated with that was R left, which hasn't changed, times R right, that has changed. What is R right? What is the resistance from this node to ground? What do you see looking up here? Rm, right? Yes, it's Rm parallel RO, but Rm parallel RO is always Rm. Okay? So, it's Rm instead of R2. So it, it went from being 2 kilo ohms to being 25 ohms. Almost reduced by a factor of, uh, almost by two orders of magnitude, right? And that. So let's update our tau mu. So our new tau mu is what? So this is, instead of R2, this has become Rm. And then this has become Rm. And this has become something interesting. What is GMRM? One. Right. So this is one. So now what do I have? So this has become also RM. And this is RM. So this is again one. So this has become two. So the Miller multiplication factor has gone from 81 to two. Right? And therefore, if I put this, plug this here, so this becomes 25 ohms, and this becomes 25 ohms times, no, it becomes another 700, right? So it becomes essentially 14, um, 1.4 kilo ohms, something like that, times 220 femtoseconds. Um, no, I can, I can calculate. Uh, so it's 1.4 kilo ohms times 20, so it's 2.8 kilo ohms, it's 28 picoseconds, right? So it went down from 1,200 picoseconds to 28 picoseconds. You can clearly see it's non-dominant right now. It's actually probably one of the smallest time constants. And it's a smallest time constant because it is on the lower, lowest resistance node. In fact, you could actually have more capacitance here and it wouldn't do anything, or not much, because the resistance on this node is very small, right? Okay, so, but now we have another time constant. I have to calculate this tau E. No, did I? No, okay. This was CMU, sorry. Okay. So now, let's, let's calculate the tau E for that capacitance. So to have a tau E zero, which is CE times what? The resistance that, C, that this capacitor sees, 
when all the other capacitors are ground. So what is the resistance it sees? It's Rm parallel RO, but we are ignoring ROs, right? So it's just Rm times CE. So it's CE Rm, which is 150 femtofarad times 25 ohms, which is what? Um, 300, 450? No, 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 375. So it's like um, 0.38, I think, picoseconds, if I'm not mistaken. Let me double check. Sorry? Yes, that's right, you're right, actually, 3.8, not, not 0.38. Yes, 3.8. Thank you. Let's say four picoseconds, roughly, right? So that's nothing. That's the node that basically can handle a lot of capacitors because it's such a low resistance node. And then tau L, has tau L changed? Yes, because the capacitance changed a little bit. The capacitance went up to 220 femto now, right? Because we had that extra capacitance, or did it? Yes, because we have absorbed the CMU into that, right? So it became 220 femtoseconds, so femtofarads. So this, this became 220 femto, so this became 440 picoseconds. Okay, so now what is the new t sum of the time constant? So this is attempt two. So this is attempt one. Omega H2 now is one over approximately one over 70 pico, 28 pico, so that's a 100 pico, 102 pico, so that's like, let's say 100 pico there, 540, 440, let's say 540, 450, 400, 540, something like that, or 550 um, picoseconds, right? And that is, um, Okay, so that would correspond to 294 megahertz. So it's 2 pi times 294 megahertz. So we went up by factor of three, right? We improved our bandwidth by factor of three because we identified the source. Now, okay, are we done or can we do more? Well, let's look at our time constants. Now that we've eliminated the big chunk, now we can see where the, now who's responsible, who's the big, big culprit now. Okay, this one. You know what it is? Design sometimes is like cleaning up a pond. Let's say you have a little pond, and then there's a big boulder in the middle of it. Right? You take the boulder out, throw it out, the water level goes down, you see three big rocks. You take those three big rocks out, you see seven Smaller rocks. We take those that out, water goes down, you see smaller little tiny little pebbles. And then at some point, say, well, am I going to take like the, the 50,000 pebbles out and say, oh, okay, well, you know, just, no, I'm going to leave it there. So that was the gigantic, that was the boulder we took out. Now we have the big rock. Okay? So we have to deal with that. So how do we deal with that? So now we clearly see that the low capacitance has become the culprit. Right? What do we do? Why is it high? Well, part of it is that we can say, we, you may come back and say, well, wait a second, but yes, 220 femtofarad, but you know, there is a good chunk of it is already the load. I can't change the capacitance. So yes, true, you may not be able to change the capacitance much, but does that mean that there's nothing else you can do? Yeah, you can, you can reduce the resistance. But if I cut R2, just R2 by itself, then my gain goes away. Yeah, but, but that's an expensive knob. In, we're increasing the bias current. That's, that's correct. But that's a really expensive knob. Um, and sometimes you may not want to do that. Yes, you can do that. Those, those are, so there are three different pathways. Those are the three big rocks, right? After the boulder, right? Because they're different, which one you take out. How, how do you take it out? So 
There are a few things you could do. You could say, so what are the pathways? The problem is this R2 is too large, right? What do we do? There are several solutions here. Say again? Cascode where? At the output. How would, that, how would I cascode? But I already have a cascode, right? right? So what, is, what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to reduce the time constant here, right? It's this time constant we are trying to reduce. How do we do that? Well, we can't change the capacitance that much. We may try to kind of play games with that a little bit here and there. But first of all, what there, there yes. You could buffer. So that's one of the things you could do. You can put a buffer stage. So the output resistance seen here, you remember we said like we have buffer stages that have low output resistance and high out input resistance. The output resistance being low here is helpful because then it reduces the time constant on the output. So that's one pathway. OK, so that's good. That's a pathway we'll take. But what other pathways are there before we take that pathway? You said reduce R2. How can I do that? If I reduce R2, my gain drops, right? Yeah. But is there something you can, I can do about it if this was my entirety of my amplifier? So what if I reduce my R2, R2 from, um, I don't know, let's say 200 to 50 ohm, to, no, to, to 2K to 500 ohms by factor of 4. My gain drops by factor of 4, right? So instead of being 50, it becomes like, I don't know, 12. So I don't have enough gain. Is there a way to get more gain? Yeah, maybe, ca maybe cascade or put two in series. If I have two amplifiers with a gain of 12, what's my overall gain? 144, right? I mean, right? So I can actually get it off of multiple stages. I can divide my gain among multiple. And that, this is what we do if you want to do a broadband amplifier. That's one of the paths. And we'll talk about that when we get to the broadband amplifiers. That's the pathway we'll discuss there. But now let's try to get as much gain from a single gain stage. Let's see what we can do. So we go path of the buffer. And there are other pathways you can take. So we want to introduce a buffer. How can we make a buffer? What is a buffer stage? Are we familiar with something that has high input impedance and low output impedance? Common collector, right? Or emitter follower. So you can actually do something like this. We can put a current source here. And then you can connect it to your C out. Now here, your C out is going to CL is going to be just C out, so it's going to be just the C out, so it's going to be just 150 femtoamperes. You have the C pi of this guy, right? And then you have C mu of this guy, which is going to be in parallel with the C mu of this guy, both to ground. So I absorb these two into a C mu to ground. So let's call it C whatever. I don't know what, what we call it. C2, which is going to be 40 femtofarads. This C pi is 100 femtofarads. And this CL is this. And this guy doesn't matter, really, because this is ground. The CS of that thing doesn't matter, because it's grounded on both sides. OK, so let's go and calculate these things. Uh, so we need to give them names. Um, so we call this tau, yeah, I call that tau c. Let's call this cc, c sub c collector. So, okay, now how many poles and how many zeros now? Let's forget about this one. Forget. So let's look at this again and say how many poles and how many zeros. How many poles? Well, in this combination here, how many poles do we get? How many different independent degrees of freedom do you have here? Two. You have one more here, OK? And one more here, that's five. But if I set the initial condition here and there, can I set this initial condition? No, because I have a capacitive loop. See, these are both ground. So I get two here and two here. So I should have four poles, OK? So I have four poles. How many zeros do I have? How many zeros do we have here? Well, I had one zero from shortening of this guy. Would give me a non-zero transfer function, right? Now, but how about this? If I short circuit this one, 
would I still get a non-zero transfer function? Right, because it shorts this input to the output, right? Now, is, what is this zero? Is it left half plane or right half plane? Does it change the polarity of the gain? No, so it's left half plane. So you have one right half plane, zero, one left half plane, zero, and four poles. Does it make sense? OK. So let's do the bandwidth estimation. So let's see what has changed. So this time constant hasn't changed. This time constant hasn't changed. This time constant, now we have to cap. OK, now this hasn't changed either. The output time constant now is changed completely. So let's call this CC, tau C. So let's put something here, tau C0. It's going to be CC, which is this capacitance, times the resistance seen by this guy. What is the resistance seen by CC? R2, right? Because if this is like a current source, this is large value, and then it gets multiplied by beta. So this resistance is going to be pretty large. So it's going to be parallel with R2. So it's going to be essentially R2CC, right? And what is it going to be? This is what's 40 femtofarads times 2 kilo ohms. It's going to be 80 picoseconds. All right? So that's for that. There's this C pi, whatever, 2, or C pi 3, right? Let's call it tau pi 3. So what's the time constant associated with that? What is the resistance seen by this guy? Think about the T model. What do you see there? This side is open from the, because it's a current source, right? From an AC perspective, it's open. So what do you see? What is the resistance seen by C pi 3? It's alpha Rm, right? So you have tau pi 3, 0. It's going to be C pi, what did we call it, C pi 3, uh, alpha Rm. Let's say call it just Rm, alpha Rm. And then that capacitance, did we, what did we calculate it to be? So it's like 100 femtofarads. So it's 100 femtofarads times 25 ohms. So that's uh, 2.5 picoseconds. That's nothing. Right? Now, and then the, for, now for the tau f, see, what is the resistance seen by this guy? It's the resistance you see looking at the output of this guy, right? You remember the reflection rule. These are all low frequency calculations, right? So R2 divided by beta plus 1, right? You're going to look at it from the emitter, you get divided by beta plus, or beta. So this is 2, and two kilo ohms divided by 100, 20 ohms, in series with Rm, which is 25 ohms. So this is going to be modified. So this culprit now is much better. So this is going to be R2 divided by 1 plus beta plus alpha Rm, which I write it as basically, and the value of the capacitance was what? 150 femtofarads, 150 femtofarads times 20 ohms plus 25 ohms. So it's 45 ohms times 150 femtoseconds. Um, it's um, seven picoseconds. Sorry? In this? Your question, your question is about the value of the capacitance? Why is it 150? You're asking why it's 150? So remember, this is hanging off of the emitter. That capacitor is up here. The output is now take, not taken out of this. So CS is up here. So that's, that doesn't appear in that. So yeah, so, so that's, this is 2.5 kilo ohms. And that's for that. And then, then we have the tau C, which we calculated to be um, OK. So tau C, I may have made a little calcul calculation error. So let me just double check. Let's see. Um,
Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I forgot one capacitor here, actually, which is this capacitor includes this CMU, that CMU, plus this CJS, the collector capacitance, right? So that's 90 femtofarads, not 40. Do you understand why? Because it's this one plus this one plus the one from the collector of this guy to ground, CJS. So this is CS 50 plus 20 plus 20, so that's 90 femtoseconds. So this needs to be 90 femtofarads. And that makes this uh, value 180 picoseconds. Roughly. Okay. And that's an important one not to make a mistake on because that's now the dominant source. Right? So now let's look at it. What is dominant? The 70 picoseconds, 28 picoseconds, 4 picoseconds, 180 picoseconds, and 4 and 7. So you add them all up, and then you get a time another time constant. And then the bandwidth estimate for this is going to be uh, 540. 500, 540, 540, 546 megahertz times 2 pi, that's omega h3. And by the way, I forgot to tell you what the simulation estimates for the other two are for that second attempt. Mm. So for this one, for attempt two, the simulation estimate of this one is 337 megahertz, if you simulate it. And it's in, you can see the results in the Bode plot. And there you can actually see that there's, other, there, there, there's another pole at 400 megahertz, at 1.5 gigahertz, and 40 gigahertz. And then here, for the third attempt, what we have is the simulation estimates now 717 megahertz bandwidth. And then you can see other poles in the transfer function, which is like the two poles around one gigahertz and um, one around 15 gigahertz. And there's another pole zero combination around 50 gigahertz. But here, here's the key. You see that we are improving, we improve the bandwidth progressively in this process. But the key part of all of this one is that now if you look at the time constants, you don't see a massive dominant time constant. I mean, yes, still this one is large and we can improve it. But the difference between the other ones is becoming smaller. It's where that you're taking the rocks out and you get more of smaller rocks, right? Now, if you wanted to improve it beyond this, what would you do? So we are going to stop here, but just a quick, quick question. What would you do? So obviously, we have to go after this guy, right? And that time constant is coming from this resistor with whatever capacitance you have here. So now we can go down the path of reducing this resistor. The first thing I would do is to be less wasteful. I would say, I'm wasting power here. I'm wasting gain here at the input. I have this divider, right? And because of that, I have to make my R2 quite large. If I could get rid of this divider loss, attenuation, then I would, can reduce my R2, right? So how do I get rid of that? You can put a buffer here. You can put a common collector here and make the impedance look like, look larger. So then you wouldn't need to have a 2 kilo ohm resistor. You can make it 1.2 kilo ohm. And that time constant goes down. And now if that's not enough, you can divide it into multiple stages and get the product of those gains. And then, of course, then at some point you get to other trade-offs. But you can see that we got significant improvement. We went from less than 100 megahertz to, to let's say, around 100 megahertz to around 700 megahertz. And you can see it remains conservative. And you can actually see the less dominant of a time constant or pole you have, the more conservative it becomes. It was less conservative here than it was here, right? So we'll discuss this more later. Any questions? <laughs>